I wrote something on the board here, Joel Osteen's Jesus. And if you'll notice, the S's are dollar signs. I love wearing that out in public because I always get response on it. And I learned something the other day. Maybe it'll help you. I was going into a public supermarket, and a fellow saw me with that shirt on. He said, he started laughing, said, I like your shirt. And I walked over to him, and he was a businessman-looking sort of fella. Uh, he was retired, but he and his wife were both retired. And, and I realized when he said, uh, I started to introduce myself. I said, I'm Jim Bry, and I got that. He said, I know who you are. You're that guy on TV. Boy, you teach some real in-depth things. You take everything down to the 13th step. He said, I really, really enjoy what you preach. I said, well, do you see me now? He said, no, we switched to direct TV. Well, I am not on direct TV. I'm on, I'm on Comcast. And it made me realize as much as he admired my knowledge and my understanding of the Bible, he wasn't interesting in pursuing it because they just kind of wiped me off their map and went on direct TV and watched something else. And I began to realize, uh, talking to him the other day, I began to realize that everybody that can recognize the truth doesn't want to live in it. That's the thing. It upsets their world, and I began to realize that, that what it does when you tell people Christmas is pagan, Christmas is Christ mass, you can get that out of any dictionary, out of any set of encyclopedias. It is the Roman Catholic mass. That's what it is. The mass is eating human flesh. When the priest raises the Eucharist up, and utters the words, hoc est corpus eum fili, they say that turns into the literal body of Christ. You tell people that, that that is the Roman Catholic Mass, they don't want to hear that. If you tell them that predestination is true and that God does not love everybody, you tell a business person, a man who can think rational, what he's going to do, he looks at his wife and they're going to, we have to go tell all of our friends. We've got to tell all of our. Uh, we've got to tell all of our family this. That's going to upset everybody. That's going to make them mad at me. It's the point is, you can't get mad at people for not being willing to go on ahead and maturing. You can't mature in the faith. It takes years to mature. You have to have to do a lot of reading in the Bible, a lot of studying. Now, that's what I'm trying to do, is trying to tell you what the Bible says. I'm trying to teach you what it says about things. I'm going to talk to you this morning about something that really bothers people. People will try to say, the tithe has been done away with. It has not. There was no, there was no uh, ritual with the tithe. When the Bible says blotting out, Colossians 2.14, blotting out out the handwriting, this is Colossians 2.14, the handwriting of ordinances People say the law was blotted out. It was not. There's two handwritings. But only the ordinances were blotted out. There's two parts to the law. There's two parts. There's the spirit and the letter of the law. Well, can you prove that, Jim? Yeah, I can. 
Look over in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, not 1st, 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, and this will tell you about the spirit and the letter of the law. Look here in 2 Corinthians 3, and there's two handwritings. One is on tables of stone. The other is on the fleshy tables of the heart. Which one would, you, would God blot out? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was against us, the rituals of the law. The rituals. The word is dogma. To be dogmatic means to quote from a ritual or something like that. So the ordinances were all that was blotted out, but there's the spirit in the letter. There was, the law was written on tables of stone, law on tables of stone in the Old Testament, written by the finger of God, tables of stone. In the New Testament, this chapter is going to tell you about where the law is written now. It was written on tables of stone and kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was inside the temple. The temple was a long, oblong building. This is the same thing over here. That was the tabernacle in the wilderness. It was built on the same dimensions as the Later on, the temple was built on the same dimensions as that. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the tables of stone. You can read this in Deuteronomy, the ninth chapter, and several other places. And it was inside the Ark of the Covenant. The law was written on tables of stone, the law. But they had all these rituals that had to do with the temple that the Levites... Levi was the third son of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel in the 32nd chapter of Genesis, Genesis 32. And the firstborn son of Jacob was Reuben, Reuben, and the second son was Simeon, and the third was Levi, and the fourth was Judah. These were sons of Leah. Leah. You can find the sons of Jacob mentioned in Genesis 29 and 30. If you want to read that, he'll tell you all about the sons they had and then after she had sons and Rachel was barren and she said, well, just for that, I'm going to have my, my, my handmaid come in to Jacob and have sons. And the handmaid was Bilhah. Bilhah. And she had Gad and Asher. And then it goes on down, Naphtali. You have Naphtali. T-A-L-I. Naphtali. And it goes on down to all the different sons that these handmaidens had. Finally, God blessed Rachel, and she had one of the best sons she could ever have, Joseph. And because Reuben was unstable as water, God took his inheritance, gave it to Joseph's second-born son, Ephraim, and gave the priesthood. He gave the kingship to Judah, the fourth son. That was the privilege of the, of the, of the patriarch and gave the priesthood to Levi. Now, the priesthood was all over Israel. This is when they went into the promised land. 
the land was divided up by Joshua. When you read the book of Joshua, you'll see he divided up the land to Simeon, Reuben, Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, Gad, Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, Asher, and Naphtali. He divided up, but you can notice the Levi's not on there. That's because the priesthood lived all over Israel so they could be there for the people when they needed to offer sacrifices. They didn't own any land. They had no inheritance in Israel. That takes us, well, let's finish reading this. All right. There in verse 2, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of men. Your life is an epistle. What you do is what people read. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone any longer, but in fleshy tables of the heart. So in Colossians 2.14, what he blotted out was the rituals written in tables of stone. Then he goes on to say, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who hath also made us this us able ministers of the New Testament, not in the letter, but in the Spirit. For the letter killeth, the rituals kills, but the Spirit giveth life. So when Colossians 2.14 says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, this is another one of those things. If you don't know, you'll have no idea what that chapter is about. You can't hardly find much on blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, taking a nail and driving it through the original contract. When you had a contract between two parties, they had to have two witnesses to the contract, and they would take the witnesses out in public and validate the contract. When they wanted to invalidate it, they would take the witnesses in public and say, is everybody, are the two witnesses here that say yes? Are the two original contractors here that say yes? And you're wanting to invalidate this? Is this all agreed by you all that say yes? They would say, let's drive a nail through it. And that would invalidate the contract. It was the same thing as taking a notary step and notarizing it. And that held up in their courts of law. The reason I went through this again is because the tithe had no rituals to it. They were required before sundown on Friday, their day began at 6 o'clock in the evening. Saturday, or not Saturday, but their Sabbath started at 6, what we call 6 Friday evening, and it ended at 6 the next day. Where'd that come from? Well, Genesis is the first chapter. The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening comes first. And they said their day began at 6 o'clock in the evening and ended. So they had to bring their tithe to the priest with no rituals. They just handed it to them. And people say, I thought that was a, I thought you had to, it was only animals. Let me ask you this. Does that mean only the shepherds and the men who herded cattle had to pay tithe. The fisherman didn't have to pay tithe. What's the fisherman going to do? Bring a tenth of his catch and put it over in a storehouse and let it stay there till they all wanted to eat it? It's going to stink in two days. The fisherman had to buy, or if you worked in a marketplace, you had to buy, you had to buy a lamb, or you had to take a half shekel, which was the price of a lamb, and take it to the priest. You had to redeem it. If you had, when you had a whole flock of sheep and you're counting the sheep coming into the fold, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the tenth sheep belonged to God. 
That's all there was to it. But that's Fluffy, my favorite sheep. Fluffy has to die. That's the way it is. You couldn't... That was what God said that Israel did. He said, you offer the poor, the lame. Let me show you something over here in, in Malachi. God says you offer the lame and the blind for sacrifice. That's not sacrifice. Sacrifice has to cost you. And it has to be offered with salt. <laughs> Look over in Malachi. And Malachi, Malachi is like all the rest of the prophets. He is preaching against Israel for their idolatry. In verse 7 of Malachi, the first chapter, Malachi is condemning Israel for going after other gods. And when they didn't, they gave a poor sacrifice. He says in verse 7, You offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, When have we polluted thee? And that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. The table of the Lord was the altar right outside the front door of the temple. That's where the, the priest had a flesh hook they ate from these altars. They ate the showbread inside of the temple. That's they stayed on, they stayed on a, uh, on an order, for about seven days. They had to eat, and they took a flesh hook, whatever was being offered that day. If it was a young bullock to purify the priest, if it was a sacrifice of a lamb, for they'd have lamb chops that day. They'd reach down in that that altar, and they'd pull out, and what they pulled out, they got to eat for that day. That was called the table of the Lord. It's really amazing. Paul speaks of the table of the Lord in 1 Corinthians. Look over there in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. And then I'll come back to this. I'm not going to turn away from Malachi. But go to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. All right. 1 Corinthians 10. I'm just going to read you a verse here. All right. No, excuse me for... All right. He says here in... Uh, in verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot, be, you cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You see that word devils? It's the word damonion. It's our word demon. Whenever you see drinking of a cup, to drink of a cup meant to die. Jesus asked James and John in Mark 10, can you drink the cup that I drank up? He's talking about his death the next day. He's not talking about drinking grape juice. He's talking about dying. To drink of a cup meant to undergo a death, a severe ordeal. He said, can you drink the cup that I drank up? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? A blood baptism was a death. He said, I'm going to die. Can you do that? So drinking of a cup meant to die. Here's the thing that, he's, that Paul is saying here. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord. You cannot die to self. You can't die to self and the cup of demonion, which is our word demon. And it means to distribute fortunes. Here, this is the funny thing. I brought this out so many times before. You cannot die to self and distribute fortunes to self. That, that's, that's what he's saying. And you can't eat at the Lord's table and the table of demons or self. Demons are self. There's no such thing as demons. I've gone through that. Jesus said they were self in Mark, the first chapter. He rebuked the man and the man said, what have we to do with thee? And he used plural, 
and Jesus rebuked him, A-U-T-O. That is the word masculine, gender, singular. Jesus rebuked, that's our word auto, and automobile is self-mobile. He rebuked self. So I want you to get a hold of this. You cannot doubt a self and fulfill self at the same time. He's not, actually, he's giving you a law of physics here. You can't be on the top of a building and on the first floor at the same time, can you? He's saying that's not possible. That's what Paul is saying. So when we're talking about the table of the Lord, let's go back over here to Malachi. They would dip into that table. The priests, the Levites would. And he says, you offer the blind in verse. He says, how do we offer bad sacrifice to you, Lord? If you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? Wait a minute. He was saying, when you count ten, seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't care if that's fluffy. It belongs to God. You can't pick your sacrifice. It's not sacrifice if you take a blind lamb, one that's crippled, it's about to die anyway. Okay, God, I'll give that to you. He says, sure you will. That's what Malachi is telling them. You offer the blind for sacrifice. It's not sacrifice unless it costs you something. If you're out there getting free DVDs, I understand if you're poor. But if you make a good living, you ought to support this message. If you believe in it. I've had to stop TV on a bunch of cities. I got, I, should, I read off all these cities. I got 75 cities were on TV. A lot of them are big cities like Dallas and, and Fort Worth and Chicago and Los Angeles and New York and uh, all over the country. But we can't be on there unless you support it. I'm not a money preacher, but I can't preach this message without telling you the truth about this. It's going to cost you. He says, is it not evil to offer the lame for sacrifice? Offer to the governor. When it comes time to pay your taxes, tell the governor, well, I know you said I owe you $5,000. I'm going to give you 200 okay? <laughs> tell the IRS that next time you want to, you've got an excuse for, well, I got my excuse. Well, no, you don't. I tithe. My wife tithes. I don't ask her what she's going to give, and she don't ask me what I give. But we give a tenth. Will it will he will the governor be pleased with thee or accept thy person, said the Lord of hosts? No. Boy, we think God doesn't need anything to live on. I've that let me get back to where I was. Let's go back over here to Revelation. Revelation seven. We were going through this and what got me to this was I was teaching Revelation 7. Revelation 7. I don't preach for money. I don't want you to give if God hasn't dealt with your heart to give. I don't hear preachers say that. There's two things that are required in giving to God. There is sacrifice It has to cost you, and there is salt. Every sacrifice, which includes you and me, has to be offered with salt. Boy, that sure makes that nice that God had them salt these sacrifices because the priest is going to eat from those. Isn't that great? They had something to flavor the, the beef or the the bullock or the young lamb or the whatever they're eating from the sacrifice. That, that wasn't a waste of time. This was the table of showbread here. And the Bible says, we being many are one bread and one body. So if we're the bread, all of it has to be offered with salt. Well, let me give you that real quick before we get loose in Revelation. 
Go back to Leviticus, the second chapter. Leviticus 2. Leviticus is the law of the Levites. Levi was the third son of Jacob. His name was changed to Israel in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. He had 12 sons. I'm trying to teach you so you can learn. It's a thrill to me to give, not just to the poor, but to give to the ministry. It takes a lot to keep this ministry going. We've got 2500 a month in DVDs. We got $4,000 every month on TV stations. It used to be 12000 a month. We got $1,700 every month for rent. We've got cameras. We've got, we got engineers we have to pay. Mike always getting with an engineer. We got the board back in the back if anything needs repairing. We have lights. That's costing us somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four hundred a month. Uh, we've got a payroll. Takes five of us working all the time to keep this ministry going. Dave, Tom, Mike, Mary, and me. You say, well, what are we paying you for? Sixty-three years of study, digging day and night. I didn't learn all this all at once. Not after, I didn't study last week for this. So we got above $14,000 a month, every month for a payroll. We've got the internet, we have to pay every month. Every year we pay right at $5,000 for insurance. We call it errors and emissions in real estate. It's in the event you make some error and somebody decides to sue you and our insurance takes hold. You can't go on these TV stations without it. I don't know if you think they give it to us, but they don't. We've got, and I, they, only they could tell me the other expenses. And if you call Mike nearly any day of the week, he answers the phone, the phone he's right back there. He's making DVDs all day long, every day, around the clock. I don't know how he does all that. And I don't have no idea what he does. I wouldn't know how to go back there and turn that equipment on. That's his job and his business. Tom takes care of our computers. He's got a degree in computers from college. He knows a lot about computers. We've had to hire guys that are into computers constantly to either do a repair or install something. I don't know how much money that is. They're expensive. Now, all right, let's go back here to Leviticus. Leviticus. The second chapter. I'm just going to verify this to you. Exodus, Leviticus, the second chapter, in verse 12. As for the oblation of the first fruits, you shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. And every oblation, that's the bread offering, we being many are one bread. Every oblation of thy meat offering shall thou season with salt. Every bread offering with the bread, and it has to be seasoned with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God, but lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. What does that have to do with me and you? Well, goodness, it has a whole lot to do with us. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt, if you're going to offer a sacrifice, you're going to tithe, it takes a long time to learn this. I don't expect everybody to understand this all of a sudden. If the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing. It's to be thrown out into the street. 
If you take salt and you don't have it protected inside a container, some of the chlorine, it's sodium chloride is what it is. If you leave it out overnight, just pour some on a piece of paper and leave it out for a couple of days, what happens? The cutting edge to it evaporates and it's gone. It doesn't have that edge anymore. The Bible and the word savor is the word moreno. So when you're offering sacrifice, you have to have moreno. That means an empty headed simpleton. You have to look like we get the word moros from that, which is our word moron, and usually it's the word fool. Anytime you find the preaching of the gospel is them that perish foolishness, to those people who don't believe the truth, we look like a bunch of morons. That's what we're supposed to look like. That has to happen with the sacrifice. If you don't learn that, the sacrifice of self cannot be offered without being the savor of the salt. I understand. I've been studying 63 years. Started when I was 17, back in 1956. I understand. I didn't know what I was doing for a lot of years. It takes a long time to mature. I don't blame somebody for seeing me on TV. That's really good. That's really true. But we don't want to get involved in that now because we're going to make our family mad by telling them the truth about Christmas and Easter and, and Halloween. And, and, and Halloween and Christmas are the same thing in different <coughs> cultures in the ancient world. They're the same thing. I don't have time to go through that every time I teach. When you find out you have to look foolish, the Bible says we have to be salted with fire. Now that's pretty hard. We have to be salted because the trying of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. You need to tithe. But you need to do it cheerfully. Everything you give needs, that's not, the word is hilaros. Uh, God loveth a cheerful giver, H-I-L-A-R-O-S. That doesn't mean hilarious like you hear preachers say. That means a very forward person that you're wanting to do this cheerfully it's something you're desiring to do. It has to do with self-sacrifice. So every, if you're going to sacrifice, it has to be done with salt. Let me give you something here. Uh, well, let's go back. I've got so many things to say on this. Let's go back to Revelation. Well, let me let me give you... Go to the 24th chapter of 2 Samuel. You cannot sacrifice if it doesn't cost you. And it doesn't cost if you say, I'm going to give a dollar. I'm going to do that cheerfully. No, you're not. You do that regretfully. If you do it, you're going to do what you're supposed to do. All right, let's go over here to 2 Samuel. This is one of my favorite chapters and my favorite uh, verses on sacrifice. Second Samuel 20. This has to do with sacrifice. David numbers Israel in Second Samuel, the 23rd chapter. And he's talking about all of his mighty men. He talks about uh, his nephew, Abishai. 
Abishai was a bad dude. He went everywhere David went. Uncle David, I'll go kill this dead dog. David said, oh, shut up, Abishai. David's always wanting to go to war against somebody. When the guy was throwing stones at David in that 16th chapter of First Samuel, David is running for his life. Or excuse me, Second Samuel. And David's running for his life. And Abishai said, Uncle David, I'll go kill that dead dog. He said, let him throw stones. Shut up, Abishai. He even said at one point, these sons of Zeruiah, Z-E-R-U-I-H, Zeruiah was his sister. And she had two boys that David put to work in the palace, had Joab, and David said, whoever can go conquer these men of Jebus, which is what they call Jerusalem before it was Jerusalem, whoever leads the way and conquers them, he'll be my commander. Joab said, that's me. And he went out in front of everybody and conquered the, Je the Jebusites. David appointed him general, commander in chief. But... Joab was a murderer, and he was David's nephew. He murdered Amasa. He murdered uh, Absalom. He, w I mean, he was always killing somebody for no reason. He murdered Abner, a wonderful man of God. And, As and Abishai, Abishai was the brother of Joab. And Abishai went everywhere that David went, and he's always opened his mouth, wanting to start a fight or kill somebody. You didn't mess with these two guys. They were dangerous. David said one day, these sons of Zerah are too hard for me. I can't keep them in control. You couldn't even control them. Whenever Joab killed David's, there, Joab was his nephew, but he, when he killed David's son Absalom, when he hung himself in a tree, and he come up on him, David had already given him instructions, don't anybody harm Absalom. I love Absalom. Even though he's trying to take over the kingdom, trying to overthrow me, I love Absalom. Don't hurt him. Joab came up on him and said, I don't care what David said. Pulls out a spear and throws it through Absalom and kills him, just a murderer. David is crying back there when he gets the word that Absalom is dead, and Joab goes back to back to Jerusalem, finds David, and he jumps his case and chews him out. Say, so what are you doing crying over Absalom? He was trying to take your kingdom. He was not to be messed with, not even by David. The commanding generals ruled the roost because their armies would follow the commander. And they followed Joab wherever he went. And he was a fighter. And when you look here, in, you look here, he's talking about the mighty men in verse 18 of chapter 23 of 2 Samuel. Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, David's sister, was chief among these three supermen. And Abishai lifted up his spear against 300 men and killed all of them. Don't mess with Abishai. He'll get you. Whoa. And he's always wanted to kill somebody. So he went out and killed 300 men and had the name among three. But the point is, David is numbering his mighty man, and he shouldn't be numbering anybody. There was a time that he only had 400 men following him, and they were humble, gentle, quiet men. And David is bragging in this 23rd chapter about what he... I'm still talking about sacrifice. Still talking about it. And was he not most honorable of the three? Therefore he was their captain, howbeit he attained not unto the first three. There was another man that was bad dude. His name was Benaiah. 
Benaiah in the next verse, when Solomon became king, Benaiah, I've gone through this, killed Joab. Boy, he had to be a tough guy to kill Joab because Joab was a mean killer. I don't want to go through that again. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabziel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Huge guys. That was Benaiah. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. But he went down to the man with the staff and plucked his spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. Benaiah was not to be fooled with. Now David is bragging about these guys. I'm talking about sacrifice. So the Bible says in the 24th chapter, the first verse, and again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and God moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Go number about how great your men are. And he had a million eight hundred thousand men fighting men in Israel. It'll tell you that over in, in First Chronicles, the 21st chapter. You don't find that in this chapter, but you look at First Chronicles and you get the corresponding chapter. It'll tell you this is how many men he had, a million eight hundred thousand. And he was bragging on it by numbering these mighty men. And God said, just for that, I'm going to send something on Israel, David. And he sent a prophet to David. He tells the prophet, Gad, you go tell David this in verse 13. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Saw seven years of famine come upon the land. Remember the three judgments of God before God would bring the final judgment on Israel? Sword, famine, pestilence. He names all three right here. He says, Shall seven years of famine come upon the land, David, because of your sin of pride? Or will thou flee three months before thine enemies? Three months the sword will be after you. And he said, while they pursue thee, or oh, will you take three days pestilence from me? This is God confronting David. How would you like to have this choice of three? Would you like to have, uh, all right, three days pestilence. Boy, when it comes from God, it ain't, it ain't just uh, fleas or something like that. It's deadly. Or would you like to flee from your enemies, the sword, for th three months? Or you want seven years of famine? Now, advice. <laughs> Boy, I don't want to give this kind of advice to God. Which one of these do I want? Well, there's one of them that came from God directly, and that was the pestilence. And see what answer I will return to God that sent me. That's what the prophet said to David. David said unto Gad, I'm in a great strait. Boy, I guess you are. <laughs> you want one of the, which one of these judgments you want to come upon you, David? David said unto Gad, I'm in a great strait. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord. I'll take the three days pestilence. And his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man with the sword. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan, the northernmost city in Israel, to Beersheba, the southernmost town. There died from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men in the first move of God's hand. You know, I believe that's Michael the archangel. I believe he's the death angel of God. 
He's the one that killed 185,000 men in one night. That's better than karate. That's better than, what was that championship thing that we're us had? Kung Fu. That's better than Kung Fu. And when the angel stretched forth his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him. He didn't cry down some aisle. The word means to turn. He turned him of the evil. God turned away from the evil that he was. He was doing this evil to Israel. People say, God don't create evil. What do you think this is? Killing 70,000 innocent men because of David's sin. And said to the angel that destroyed the people, God said to the angel, that's enough. I've killed enough people. Stop. Stay now thine hand and the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Arana. Oh, man. The threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. So David goes to Arana. He says, I would like your threshing floor. I need to offer a threshing floor. Let me tell you what that's about. That's a pure plain thing to purify the land with. The threshing floor was like an indention in the ground. It was like a, like so. Going along and it come up like this. And then it was like so. If this is a big round thing here. And they had something called a fan. And the fan was a big shovel type thing. They would throw it up in the air when the wind was blowing it would blow away the chaff and the seed buds or the, or the buds of wheat would fall down in the threshing floor and they would gather them up and the wind would blow the chaff away. That's what God says. That's even what John the Baptist said. He said, there comes one after me whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to lose. He'll baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire whose fan is in his hand and he purges his floor. You don't even know what that means when you're reading about John unless you understand this. He's going to purge Israel here. So David goes to Aaron and says, I need your threshing floor. My heart's broken. I've sinned against God. I need to offer him a sacrifice. Arana said, well, you can have it for nothing. David said, no. I may be the king, but I'm not going to take advantage of you. Here's David's words. One of my, now, this has to do with you and I when it comes to sacrifice. David's talking about offering sacrifice to God. Look at verse 24. And the king said unto Arana, David said to Arana, nay, I will not take it for free. But I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offering unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. Your sacrifice cannot be costless. You can get all these DVDs I send. They're free. I don't charge for the DVDs. You can have them. We spend about 2500 a month giving away DVDs. We never ask anybody a penny for them. We give the gospel without charge. Do you take the gospel without charge? Do you think we're sitting here and we just, I've got a money tree in my backyard and I pay all the bills with that? There's two pear trees. There's two pear trees back there. And all we could do was get a bushel of pears and sell them, I guess. David bought the threshing floor of the ox for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. This was God killing people in Israel. Now, let's go back to Revelation.
I've got to get back to the tithe. Well, I don't understand why God killed the people if it was David's. I don't understand that either. David's doings, why David chose that. That's a good question. It, it was the least I don't try to figure out why God kills who he kills. He'll kill innocent people. Let me put it this way. He might kill your kids for your rebellion. He did that many times, more than once. That is called collateral damage. <laughs> yeah, that's called collateral damage on your kids, yeah. So you can't just do, the, you can't live the way you want to live. Things will be different than what you think before it's over with. Now let's go back to Revelation 7. I got into Revelation 7. I hope you learned something from this. Remember, sacrifice, it's not sacrifice if it doesn't cost you. And it has to be with salt. And you have to look foolish when you're offering sacrifice. But you will look foolish the stronger you get. The stronger you get and the more you sacrifice to give God what is His. I don't consider that 10% mine. If you consider it yours, you're stealing from God. I don't consider it belongs to me. Look over here in Revelation 7. I don't know if I'm going to get through this. I keep thinking... How am I going to teach just on these few chapters? All right, Revelation 7. And after these things, I saw four angels coming down, standing on the four corners of the earth. All that had meaning. Four corners. They hadn't had, Columbus hadn't come over here. Eric the Red hadn't come over here yet. Two of the American continent. They said there were only four winds, the east wind, the west wind, the north wind, and the south wind. Everything was constructed. All Bible lands came about on the Mediterranean Sea area. There was no other lands. This was Persia over here, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran. That was Persia. Iraq, that was Babylon. Babylon, and then, of course, here in northern Babylon, up in this area, was the Assyrians, and then you had Italy, Rome ruled, Rome subjugated Greece, Alexander the Great and his great armies, and Greece overthrew the Persians, and the Persians overthrew the Babylonians. That's the way it worked. And they all came up out of the sea. That when you read the beast comes out of the sea, and the beast was Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, the Grecian leopard, and the beast with iron teeth in Daniel 7 and in Revelation 13. It, it came up out of the literal sea because their borders of this beast world system that was ruling the world was on this sea area. Gosh, I want to go into Christmas on that but I don't need to do that. Now, all right, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal, the sphragis. S-P-H-R-A-G-I-S. Sphragizo is the, is the verb form, S-P-H-R-A-G-I-Z-O. It means an official mark of ownership. When God writes upon fleshy tables of our hearts, He owns us, and He insists that we conform to the likeness of Christ. That's what predestination is about. Whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of to the icon, the likeness of Jesus. Well, if he writes upon fleshy tables of your heart, you're going to give up self. You won't do that all of a sudden. You don't grow up all of a sudden. I can't go to some little kid back here and say, 
it's time for you to grow up and get you a job. And they're going to say, well, I will if you give me about 20 years. It takes time to get mature. You can't get mature all of a sudden. I don't expect that of anybody anymore. Now, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, the Sphragis. Our seal, according to Ephesians 1.13, we are sealed with the signature of God, and His signature is the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the seal of God. That's what He... This word seal means a signature. When you put your signature on something, that means you own respond, you're owning up to the responsibility of that signature. Does that mean that? It's exactly what it means. You sign something, you sign a contract, and they say, well, you owe us this money. Well, I already spent it. I don't have it. Well, you owe it to us. We're going to sue you for it. When he guarantees us, that is, you got two, more or less two marks. You got a mark of the beast, Karagma. It means character. It comes from the word C H A R A K T E R. I didn't misspell character. That's the way it's spelt in the Bible. Character. Character is the way you pronounce it. And it comes from the word karax. And that's a stake. Where did the mark of the beast begin? It began in the garden. When God put a stake, he put a, he put a tree in the midst of the garden, and he put a stake on the boundary line and said, don't go beyond the stake. He put a tree in the middle of the garden, in the midst of the garden. He's put a tree in the midst of your life I'll make it a Christmas tree. I believe that's exactly what it was. And he said, you don't go beyond the stake. Don't go to the mark of the beast because Eve saw the tree. She saw a tree that was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. It would make her wise. And 1 John 2, 16 says, everything that's in the world, all that's in the world, you have the mark of the beast in you naturally in this flesh. When you seek the flesh, you got two men in you. If you're born again, you got the inner man and the outer man. The outer man is self, according to Paul, Paul's words in Romans 7 and in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, and in Colossians the third chapter in Ephesians, the fourth chapter talks about the inner man, put on the inner man. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you have the inner man, he will battle the outer man, the flesh, from now on. The flesh, in a sense, has the mark of the beast in it, but God's not going to save your outer man. He's going to give us brand new bodies one day, New bodies, you can find that in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. He's, gives a, he's going to give us new bodies. He's got to get rid of this distributing fortunes. Esau, a tree that's good for food. And John says in John 2, 16, 2 and 16, everything that's in the world is the lust of the flesh. That would fulfill her good for food, the lust of the eye, the pride, the pleasant to the eye and the pride of life pride is the word self-esteem a-l-a-z-o-n l-a-z-o-n-i-a self-esteem you're not supposed to have self-esteem we to esteem others better than ourselves our problem you know what our problem is is my problem that is me your problem is you. It's not the person next to you. Our problem is us. 
The old Indian chief said, I found the enemy and he is me. And that's what he is. He's us. I love that pride of that pleasant to the eye because idolatry, E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A, comes from ido, meaning to see, and latrua, meaning to serve. And the Bible says that covetousness, pleonectes, is idolatry. The hardest thing we got to wrestle with is us. Plenactase means to want more any way you can get it. Don't be satisfied with what you have. Want more. That is the battle that we're fighting with the outer man. Self. That's why if a demon is any less than self, you're in a battle you can't win. The way you win this battle, you live long enough and you learn. Look here in now, he says, this guy, is, this guy, this angel, he's got a seal in his hand, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Well, we have a sphragus of God, the signature of God on our hearts. The world has karagma, the character of the beast, and that started in the garden, and that was all that's in the world in that tree right there. That's what man wants. You know why Christmas is so hard to get over to people? Christmas is Christ's Mass, it's Roman Catholicism. It's because, I don't mean this to be offensive, but most women want the tree. And men want the women, so they're willing to give in. They want the woman. Boy, that's a battle to get rid of this tree here. <laughs> that's a, that's a never-ending battle. Now look here. I heard the number of them that were sealed. They were sealed 144,000, 144,000, all the tribes of the children of Israel, of the tribe of Judah, the fourthborn of Jacob, 12,000, Reuben, 12,000, Gad, 12,000, Asher, 12,000. These are the sons of Jacob. You can look them up in the 29th and 30th chapters of, of uh, well, I just went blank. Genesis. Genesis. <laughs> I couldn't think of Genesis. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephilim, 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi. I stopped there last week. I'm going to read the rest of it. Levi was never numbered with Israel because they were the priesthood. They got the tithe instead of an inheritance. And the Bible says there's been a transfer of the tithe to the preacher. The Bible specifically says that. Not to raise my salary any, but to pay these. If you're out there, it's to pay your TV station. People call me and say, I don't have anywhere to go to church. There's nobody out here in California. Well, support the TV. And you can join us every Sunday morning at 11 Central Standard Time and every Wednesday night at 7. And you can watch us on the Internet, 2,000 messages of these 3,919. But we can't do this alone. I'm not asking anybody for anything. I'm just telling you it's a duty of the people to support the ministry with their tenth. The word tithe means tenth. Twelve thousand out of the tribe of Issachar. Twelve thousand out of the tribe of Zebulun. And the tribe of Joseph were sealed. Twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. Twelve thousand. They got a mess here. Je Levi was never numbered. 
And Dan is not numbered in this list. And Dan was always numbered with Israel. I believe God did this to show us that the priesthood is no longer. What's the priesthood now? Uh, it's us. God hath made us priests and kings. What do kings do? They declare righteous judgment. Judge not according to the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's what a king does. And what does a priest do? He gives his body a living sacrifice. You cannot offer sacrifice anywhere in the Bible unless you're a priest. He's made us priests and kings, and our sacrifice is self. I'm going to try to tell you something here. I don't think I can convince you. God has to convince you. Giving up self is the most freedom I've ever had in my life. I am free. I'm not... I used to get up every morning. I was telling uh, the folks last night. I get up every morning. I'd put on... I looked like a million bucks. I had my nice shiny shoes on. I had my diamond rings on and, and my star sapphires and my tie matched my leather coat. I'd go out and get in my town car and go off showing houses, being proud. I was miserable. I remember riding back from Rivergate one day. I was one of the top salesmen in Sumner County, making a lot of money. And I remember driving, just saying, God, I am miserable. Get me out of this. I, I was just crying out to God. I couldn't stand the real estate I was in. Had nothing to do with money anymore. I wanted to be happy. and I've never been this happy in my life. I was bound and tied to those people to be nice, to be nice. And I couldn't hardly be nice. I didn't know how to be nice. Nice is the word nisker, N-I-S-C-E-R-E, N-I-S-C-E-R-E. -E. It's a French word. It comes from ne and skier. It means no knowledge, no knowledge. When you act nice, you're playing dumb. You're saying, ah, gosh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I'm trying to get along with everybody. Uh, I just want to be a nice guy. And I got tired of everybody around me being pretending. That's Nice is the same thing as hypocrite. A hypocrite was an actor in the first century. It was an actor under assumed character. The Bible says love... Love is not anupocrites. Anupocrites comes from Hippocrates, hypocrite. Love is walking in the commandments of God. You can't be walking in the commandments of God, walking in God's commandments and be pretending to be somebody else at the same time. That's when you come to freedom and you pokrites. It's hypocrite with the alpha in front of it, and it means no hypocrisy. You cannot love God and pretend Christianity. You can't. No way. It's not possible. You say, well, Jim, I'm just young and I'm trying to learn to grow. I understand that. It's hard growing. The fire has to come. But the fire comes with truth. As you learn these words, use one of them. Use one of the Greek words. That's what the original text was written in. What's wrong with that? Tell people what a hypocrite was in the first century. It was a man that was pretending to be something he wasn't, and he wore a mask on stage. They actually had plays back then. 
He wore a mask on stage that was always smiling and always happy. And that's phony. You know it when you get around it. And I was telling you that Dan is always numbered and he's not here. And Levi was never numbered. Let's go over here to, back to, I've got to give you this, over in Numbers, the first chapter. I'm going to read it to you again, but I read it before. Numbers, the first chapter. Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and so forth. Numbers, the first chapter. He's numbering Israel here. And verse 47, the Levites after their tribe and their fathers were not numbered with the rest of Israel. They're never numbered. So when you see a numbering with Levi numbered, it's a wrong numbering. I said the 12,000 out of each tribe was a generic name or generic number for the church. I'm not going to go through that again. If you want that, get last week's message. It's not a literal numbering. Huh? It's not a literal numbering. It's a figurative number. The 144,000 are the redeemed of Israel that follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Follow Akulatheo, A-K-O-U, L-A-T-H-E-O, A-K-O-U-L-A-T-H-E-O. They follow the Lamb. That's what the Bible says in Revelation, the 14th chapter. They follow the Lamb. Akulatheo means to be in the same way with. you got to be in the same way with. There's two ways, a narrow way and a broad way. Narrow is the word thalibo, T-H-L-I-B-O. It's a form of the word tribulation. you got to be in the tribulation way. So those of us who are in the tribulation way, we are the 144,000. That is a figurative number. There's 12,000 in each. There's 12 tribes. There's 12 apostles. And we are the 144,000. Preached that last week. I've got it on a bunch of tapes. So he says the Levites were not numbered. We've got to go back over here to... Numbers, the 18th chapter. Numbers 18. This chapter is of utmost importance because it tells you what the Levites received. What they received. And how this goes to the preacher now. Not for my welfare. I'm not going to increase my salary one bit. This is not for Jim Brown. It's for these TV stations, and it's for, it's for some of the salaries of the people. We've got a, takes about $37,000 a year to run this ministry. That's what it takes. A year. A month. Uh, a month. What? A month. You said a year. What did I say? 37000 a month. It takes about 37000 a month to run this ministry. We've got to bring in that every month. You should feel obligated to do your part. I'm not asking you for money. If you don't have sacrifice and the salt in your life, you can't offer a real sacrifice. You may offer it for a while, but you'll quit. I don't trust the people to keep the ministry going. I trust God to do that. Now, I'm going to read a verse here in Numbers, the 18th chapter, then I'm going to go over to the 9th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to match it up. 1 Corinthians, let me flip over there, and then I'll read a verse here. He's talking to Aaron and his sons. Aaron was the high priest of Israel. He was the high priest in 
Gosh, it's going to take me a long time to get through all this. All right. All right, nine. Okay. Now I'm going to read this in chapter 18 of Numbers. And the Lord said unto Aaron, the high priest, Moses' older brother, three years, three years older than Moses, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, and thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. And thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi. Now all the Levites were priests, but all the Levites weren't high priests. You had to be of the descendants, descendancy of Aaron to be a high priest. Bring thou with them that they may join unto thee and minister unto thee, but thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. That's the tabernacle over there. That's what it's talking about. And shall keep the char thy charge and the charge of all the tabernacle. They were going to take care of everything in the tabernacle. And they didn't have an inheritance. They had no land. And the tithe was the pay that they received to take care of the ministry. The tabernacle. Tabernacle is the same thing as the temple the holy place, the Ark of the Covenant. And they, and there was a precinct that only they could enter into. You had to be a Levite to come in to this precinct of the temple. There was a wall about that. They had entrances to these inner precincts. You had the, the candlesticks here, the altar of incense here, the showbread here that the priests ate from. You had the porch of Solomon here. And you had the, the brazen altar and the brazen sea. And you can see it right here. And these Levites took care of this. In the New Testament, oh, here it is. This is it right here. Let me find it. Well, well, if I had a, something in here. There it is. All these have to be Levites. All these. Everybody in there. This is the wall around this wall back here. Surrounds the temple. And only these, only Levites could come in there. You couldn't go in there without being a Levite, but the only people that could do certain things inside this temple were high priests. The only man that could come in on the tenth day of the seventh month and come through that eight-inch veil was the high priest. And he would come in and sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant. And our hearts are sprinkled there in Hebrews 10, 22. All right. So he's talking to Aaron. And he says here in verse 7, Therefore thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar. He's talking about everything. They will minister around the altar of God. This is the altar here. You had to be a Levite to offer any sacrifice on that altar. To the altar within the veil, he's talking about the altar within the veil, this one here. So the one within the veil, and ye shall serve, I have given your priest's office unto you as a service of gift, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. You can't go into the, this area without being a high priest in here up in here. You had to be a high priest. 
Now, the attendants of the altar were the Levites. Look over here in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 9. Now, he's talking about, Paul is talking in this chapter about himself going from place to place and church to church and ministering to people. How much time do I have, Mike? I don't know if I can read all this, but let's start a little earlier in the chapter. And he says in chapter 9, verse 7, Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charge? If you're drafted into the army, do you have to buy your own rifle and supply your own sword? No should be supplied by the men that inscripted you into the army. Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Paul is talking about his work in these churches. Shouldn't I eat of this vineyard? Shouldn't this church be taken care of? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? I'm going from church to church and taking care of the churches and you're the reason he's saying this to Corinth is they were a bunch of cheapskates. They weren't taking care of their duty. The Bible says that they were contentious. They were full of strife in that third chapter. They just were lazy. Say I not these things as a man, and saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses that thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. When the ox is treading the corn, he's going in a circle. Let him eat all he wants to eat. That's what Paul is saying. He's treading the corn. Why shouldn't he? I'm working. Should I receive this offering of you? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth, shouldn't he plow in hope that he's going to eat of the ground? Shouldn't I be plowing in hope that you're going to take care of me? But he later on in this chapter, he says, you have this obligation, but I'm not going to hold you to it. He even said, I had to rob the churches of, of Macedonia, which would be Philippi, and Thessalonica and Berea to pay your bills that you won't pay. And that he that threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. And we have sown, now this is, amazes me. He says, we have sown unto you spiritual things. I preach to you, I will come, give you all these definitions so you can understand it. Is it a great thing that we should not reap your carnal things, your socks? Oh, these pens ain't right and good. Carnal is not, that's not an evil word. It just means socks is the word sarkikos. That's the word carnal. It means fleshly. If I've come preaching you spiritual things, shouldn't I be given physical things? I've got to eat. I've got to pay the bills for the church. Besides that, I've got to send money to the poor in Jerusalem. And then he says, If others be partakers, after he says, I should be able to reap your carnal things, if others be partakers of this power over you, he said, this is a power that we have over you, but I'm not going to exercise it. Are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power that you're supposed to take care of me and the Timothy that comes here or anybody else that comes, but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know? Boy, this is an important thing. This is a reference back to Numbers 18. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things, 
live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar, who where was it the Levites waited at? At the altar of God. In that seventh verse of the 18th chapter numbers, that they that which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. They got to eat here of this altar. Then he says these magic words, even so are Kai. Kai. That's even, that's what it says, Kai. It means in like manner. Or it means I-E. When you see that E, it means that is to say. That is to say, so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. The same way those that minister to the altar, what did they do? Go back to Numbers 18. Now, people may not want to hear this, but this is the truth. Paul was very careful about saying things to people about money. I don't preach on money. This is the first time I've preached, even brought this up in a long time. We don't pass a plate here. We give away all of our DVDs free of charge, all of our posters and packaging free of charge. We've simply got offering boxes here and we don't ever ask you to put anything in them. That's between you and God. But I'll tell you what it does. When you start getting free, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The way I live is the most free I have ever been. I've never been this free. I have really begun to believe the message that I preach, that God is doing everything. But it is my responsibility to you to tell you these things. This is your obligation. And not just you that are here, but if you're some long distance, you're getting the DVDs. Would you like to eat for free? Would you like a free ride? Let me tell you a secret. There are no free rides anywhere. No free lunches. You pay with it. You'll pay for it somewhere along the way. You go back to this... 18th chapter, and start in verse 20. I don't have time to read all of it. Well, let me read in verse 13. Whatsoever is first ripe in the land which they shall bring unto the Lord, and everything they brought was eaten by the priest, shall be thine. Everyone that is clean in thine house shall eat of it. Everyone devoted in Israel shall be thine. Everything that openeth the matrix, which is the firstborn, and all flesh which they bring unto the Lord, whether it be men or beasts, shall be thine. He's talking to Aaron and the priests. Nevertheless, the firstborn of men shalt thou redeem, and the firstling of the unclean beast shalt thou redeem. That's because God said, I own all the firstborn. It was the firstborn of Egypt when you left Egypt that I had you put the blood on the doorpost. And if you had the blood on the doorpost, it was mine. And the firstborn didn't die in those households. God had bought them, all of them. And he goes on down here in verse 20. The Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them, I am thy part, thine inheritance among the children of Israel. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel. That's the ones ministering around the altar. That belongs to the preacher now. Don't belong to you. For them an inheritance for their service, which they serve. They lived all over Israel. But they didn't have any land. They couldn't buy it and sell it. They couldn't own it. Even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and in like manner, that belongs to the preacher of the gospel. Not so you can increase his coffers so he can get the gospel out. Do you realize how many churches I've got? I've got churches all over the country. I got them in Dallas and Fort Worth and 
Houston and San Antonio and Los Angeles and Chicago. And if you're out there and you're getting these tapes for free, maybe you haven't gotten strong enough yet to give the tithe, but it belongs to God. It belongs to the preacher to spread it out the way he would. And when you read that entire night, 18th chapter of Numbers, they get the tenth. Neither must the children of Israel, verse 22, henceforth come nigh the tabernacle of the congregation, lest they bear sin and die. And the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity, and it shall be a statute forever throughout the generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. They're not numbered with Israel. They get the tenth. But the tithes, the tenth of the children of Israel, which they offer, as in heave offering, the heave offering was all the offerings put together. Unto the Lord I have given to the Levite to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance, the Levites. That's the preacher. And that verse over there in the ninth chapter of Romans, let me read it again. Even so hath the Lord ordained. When people say the tithe is not in the New Testament, they're ignorant. You didn't have to say tithe. It says what the priest received belongs to the church. The tenth. I don't think I've ever taught on this to this degree in my entire ministry. I believe in tithe. I do it. And the poor, we need to take care of them. That's another story. I'll have to get into that next week. Do I have any time? In like manner, Jesus told the Pharisees, you tithe mint and cumin, the smallest of herbs, but you have omitted the weightier parts of the law, righteousness and peace. The Bible says in Hebrews 7 that there's been a transfer of the tithe to the preacher. People say, well, they dealt in a barter system in Israel. They were so poor. You can argue against the tithe. That's because you don't really want to support. I don't want you supporting this ministry unless God deals with your heart. You got to be the salt of the earth. You got to look like a fool. And when you start looking like a fool, you're not going to care about how you're dressed. All I want to be is clean and smell good. That's all. I don't, I walk out every day with a t-shirt on that says, God does not love everybody or something along that line. Predestination's true. I got about 50 t-shirts. I've given away a bunch of them. And all I'm trying to do is tell people the truth. That's it. I don't even have time to address this. This should be a series is what it should be. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for truth. Convict the hearts of the people according to your mercy. Lord, fight our battles. I don't want to fight anybody anymore, ever. Let the people know here that I'm for them. I'm with them, even if they don't have the conviction to support the ministry. It takes a long time to grow up. I've found that out. Thank you for truth. Lord, we love you and love this word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen.
are you doing? You little papa. Huh. I love you. You want some gum? Okay. I'll get you some. Everybody line up. Are you lined up? No, I'm not. I can You want some of this yellow gum? Well, there you go. And there you go. You want yellow? Is yellow okay? I don't know what else I got. Thank you. You're welcome. Take your brother one. Hey. How y'all doing? Hey, Jim. What are you doing, guy? Mm, hanging in there. Hanging on, huh? You were out on Wednesday. You were feeling well? I wasn't at all. I had that diverticulosis where I had swelling in my intestines. And, and it wasn't diverticulitis. That's the worst. <laughs> Well, I can't eat seeds or stuff. Right, I was going to say that's seeds. Huh? That's seeds that get stuck, right? Yeah, you got these. They said it comes with age. You got these pouches in your intestines, and they catch these seeds, and it just comes with age. You can't eat any seeds? Well, I can with diverticulosis. I just don't want to overdo it. Push it and turn it into diverticulosis. Yeah. Diverticulitis can be really bad, serious. It blocks everything up. I'm glad I don't. You want some gum? Yes, please. There's some yellow gum. Thank you. Okay. She's like an adult. Answer. She's what? Like an adult. She She's is as working. big as an adult. She's what? She's working. She's a certified babysitter. Oh, really? Where? Everywhere. Just Who are you babysitting for? My she neighbors. She babysat the neighbors. The neighbors? You're nearly as big as them. You're nearly as tall. Yeah. She's only 12 years old. <laughs> Maybe you're going to be an Amazon. You can be a basketball player. Yeah. You think? Yep. I love you guys. I really do. I Pete, just. On the tide. It's coming. Huh? I get paid once a month, so it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't hardly ever preach on that. I happened to run into it when I was in Revelation. And some of it makes people uncomfortable. Even the writers that commented on this, uh, like Kistemacher and Hendrickson, these guys, they say Paul was very gentle at approaching it because people don't want to hear it. But it's what makes you happy is when you let go of everything. You're not foolish with it, but you let go. You just let go of self and let go of, you give as much as you can. There's a people out there that are really hurting. I mean, people make 500 a month and they're living on that and paying rent on that. And I don't know how. It's just, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'll never take a raise. I just want to be on this TV out there and reaching people. That's all I want. I, the more we bring in, we're, I'm working on enough to have a building, but it's going to take about a million and a half, a million three, and I've got a little over a half a million now in the building fund. And people have accused me, you're just taking that money out of the building. I ain't taking nothing out of the building fund. People are stupid when they accuse me of that. That would be, that would misappropriating funds. They could put me in prison for that. I'm just, 
I just, if we can come up and get a building, I would like to, not a big building, just something here on Main Street. I have my eye on that vacant lot down there. The one next to that little big house that got pushed way back? Yeah. Well, it's right where that lady sets up her flowers every year. I'd love to have that lot, but I don't know that I can get it. And that's not with anything on it. That's nothing on it. And it's, it's, I'm just going to do everything I can before I die. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to worry about nothing. I've learned not to worry. Worry is nearly kill me. It's just nearly kill me. And I'm not going to do that no more. I'm not going to let people bother me that have accused me of all this silly stuff. It's between you and God. Well, first of all, I haven't done all the stuff I've been accused of. I never even met that guy around here. <laughs> if he's here, I never met anybody like that. That can do those many things wrong. I better get my stuff. Yeah. I love you. I love you too. I need a, another daughter. The one I got don't want to be my daughter. Okay. I just don't get to see you anymore. Huh? I just don't get to see you anymore. Well, I'm just always sickly. Yeah, and the kids I'm having keep a hard busy, time. So huh? The kids keep me busy. Yeah. It's just part of our life. Well, who is that?